following last week's vote, it is clear that the Government's approach had to change, and it has. <laughs> Having established the confidence of Parliament in this Government, I have listened to colleagues across Parliament from different parties and with different views. I regret, I regret that the Right Honourable Gentleman, the Leader of the Opposition, has not chosen to take part so far. All right, that was Theresa May speaking at Parliament earlier today, saying and admitting, essentially, that since her first Brexit plan went down in flames, she's ready for Plan B. Nigel Farage is a member of the European Parliament. He joins us now. So, Nigel, from what I can tell, Plan B doesn't sound a lot different from the one that went down in flames. So, so what's going to happen next? No, no, Plan B is Plan A. Make no mistake about that. Um, she's hoping to get some concessions from uh, Brussels, uh, and she'll try and renegotiate that, but I don't see much prospect of it. Uh, time is now running out. There are 68 days to go until we're due to have Brexit. Uh, legally, of course, the position is that if we don't have a deal, we leave with no deal, which I've got no problem with, Brexiteers have got no problem with, but Parliament has a massive problem with. And I, you know, of the half a dozen options on the table, if you want my prediction right now, I think she's going to become desperate and try to kick the can down the road by extending Article 50. That is my best guess right now, given it's tough to see any other solution. Nigel, Christina Partsneville is here. In the past, I've heard you speak and say that you want the fairest option, and you argue that we should go ahead with it because the people have already voted. But wouldn't you say that the original mm -hmm. referendum was partially based on lies, especially 350 million pounds that were supposed to go to the NHS, and the fact that this <coughs> latest YouGov poll that came out on Wednesday saying that those want to stay, there's a 12-point lead for people, lead, sorry, that want to stay, and perhaps maybe a second referendum might be in the cards or should be in the cards? What do you think? Well, look, you know, uh, the idea that this was based on lies, you could argue that every election in history was based on lies. <laughs> okay, good point, um, good know, point. You, you, you know, for all time. Um, come on, you know, 350 million a week may have been a slightly higher figure. But it's figure. not only that. It's, there's a few things that I feel like a, the public was deceived and just unaware of the repercussions no, no, of a no, Brexit. No, 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 no. Look, of course they weren't deceived. <laughs> the real deception was on the other side. We had 50 years of being told it was just a common market and then it became a political union. So when it comes to lies, the other side have total supremacy. Uh, look, this was the biggest democratic exercise in the history of our nation, number one. Number two, we had a general election the, a year afterwards, and both the Labour and Conservative parties said they'd take us out, and they got over 80% of the vote. And point number three, 498 MPs voted for Article 50, which clearly said we either have an agreement or we leave with no deal. Not to leave the European Union would be a massive betrayal of democracy. And don't be conned by these polls commissioned, you know, by the Remain side, asking questions in a certain way. Not a single person who voted leave has changed their minds. Nigel, Liz Peake here. Question for you. Is there any chance, do you think, that the EU is going to help Theresa May out by coming up with some changes to the original deal that she can take to Parliament, if not now, and I would agree with you, it seems sensible to extend the date in the next three or four months. <laughs> Will there be any uh, change in their view, do you think? Well, I wasn't arguing that it was sensible to extend the deal. <laughs> I was arguing that it's what may happen. Yeah, um, OK. Uh, actually, do you know what? The answer is yes. Um, I think if there was a change to the Irish backstop, if there was a change to this trap, that could keep us stuck inside the European Union's customs rules indefinitely. If there was a sunset clause, a time-limited clause, mm -hmm. then Theresa May, despite the loss of 230 votes last week, would face some chance of getting it through. So, yeah, you know, if the German car industry, if the French wine industry right. start to put pressure on to say, look, make a concession, it's still not impossible that at the 11th hour a deal of some kind gets agreed. Uh, Nigel, this is uh, Gary Kaltbaum here. Thanks for being on with us. Uh, Thursday, June 23rd, 2016 was Great the day. vote. 
we're now in 2019, <laughs> and it seems like it's still on a treadmill. And last I read, don't we have amendments coming in the House of Commons? As you mentioned, you have to deal uh, with the Northern Ireland and, and uh, Ireland also, mm. and, and that backstop. Are, are we going to be here in 2020 still discussing this? Do you know, it is a total failure of leadership from our Prime Minister and our British political class that here we are 31 months on from the referendum and given the loss last week, we've made no progress. It is pathetic, it is pitiful, we're becoming a laughing stock around the world. It's a failure of leadership. And here's why. We voted to leave, unequivocally, to leave the institutions of the European Union and what Theresa May's tried to do is to form a close and special relationship with the European Union. When in life there's a fork in the road, you have to take a route and go with it. She has tried to appease both sides and failed dismally. Hey, Nigel, it's Jonathan Honig. Thank you again for being with us. There's been some predictions of mass economic catastrophe. If there is a hard Brexit, you know, the, the pound will fall 10, 15 percent. The, the, the British stock market will fall precipitously. What's your prediction for the British economy, what? the British stock market? This is project fear. It is a total and utter rubbish. We had the same arguments 20 years ago. If we didn't join the euro, catastrophe would fall. Get a sense of perspective here. 5% of the UK economy is exporting goods to Europe. 7% is exporting goods to Europe. I'm not pretending that's not important, but we're not, you know, we're not talking about ending trade, cutting Britain off. We're talking about, in the worst case scenario, tariffs on our products. Those tariffs are less than the average movement of our currency against the euro every single month. And what you're seeing is the big corporate lobby trying to maintain the status quo. These fears are unfounded. And I promise you this, if we leave on no deal, and I hope we do, if we leave on no deal and the stock market goes down and the pound goes down, buy them both. Nigel, very quickly, we got to go, but I, I, it's yeah. so interesting how Britain and the United States very often parallel each other. They go through the same things. We now have a dysfunctional government. You seem to have a dysfunctional government. <laughs> yeah. uh, what's the end result? Is this, is this a natural kind of breakup of the establishment, the political establishment in both countries quickly? Yeah, look, you know, Brexit and Trump were the biggest shocks to Western world politics we've seen in, in modern times. Uh, the other side, the establishment, can't accept it. They're fighting back as hard as they can. But the one factor here you mustn't forget is the genie is out of the bottle. People want Brexit. People want Trump. And those results of 16 are going to prevail. Nigel, great to see you again. Please come back and see us. Thank you.